In this video I'm going to modify the Hengs Industries Vortex 1 fan which is a single speed fan to a multiple speed exhaust and intake fan with remote control. And you can buy a variable speed version of this fan and it's called a Vortex 2 but it's really not all that great. The circuit board kind of sets out in the weather and besides I want remote control. And for those of you that do not know the Vortex is designed to be a replacement or an add-on fan to a vent that would not normally have a fan and it doesn't have to be the same brand and in fact my vents in my RV I have two of them and one has a vent line brand fan which is pretty small the other one doesn't have a fan at all and I've replaced both fans with uh, Vortex replacements and in the box you get the fan itself in a bag of parts and this is the second vent line fan that I bought that did not come with instructions. There are a set of instructions on the back, but they're not complete. The main thing is it does not show you how to use this adapter. So I'm a website, of course, as you know if you looked at any of my other projects. I have a project web page. Which includes how to use the adapter. And like most of my projects, I have an associated web page that has more information and that's what I'm showing here and if you click on the upper right hand corner I'll provide a link to the web page. As we scroll through the web page you can see just some narrative. Here's a black diagram. Uh, this is the code that you'll have to download and install into the Arduino uh, programmer. And this is how to set it up if you've never done it before. PDF file on the entire build and if we look at the PDF file, we show a step-by-step -step process of how everything is done, some information, and then here we show how to install all the parts, a bill of materials, and some information on how programming the resistor, some more information on programming the receiver, and here we have the Vortex install instructions, and this is a page that they no longer put in the boxes apparently. And before we get into building the circuit board, I should show you a couple alternatives that you can use if you don't want to build a circuit board. Now, these do not have remote control capability, but otherwise uh, they will work. This one in particular seems to be fairly popular. I've seen quite a few people use this in their fan setups. The only problem I have with this is when you mount this, when the vent is open, this is exposed to the elements. I would at least recommend getting some of this silicon conformal coating. And this is a spray. And I would just spray the heck out of this because that will help waterproof it. Better solution in my view, and this is a little more heavy duty. This is functionally the same. And you see we have the potentiometer here that is on kind of a cable. And you can put this in the box and mount it underneath somewhere. Under the ceiling perhaps and then you'll want to mount the switch and the potentiometer on the fan itself but then all the electronics can be protected and I think I would put this into a box and you may have to extend the, the wires here and here to get sufficient space but I would prefer this idea a whole lot better than this one And I have the layout of all the components that we're going to use to make the circuit board that is going to be the controller that I'm going to use. And so we have the front panel that I had made from Front Panel Express that's going to go on to the fan itself. And since it needs to be water resistant, I have this box that basically fits on the back side of this. All the components go on a circuit board. That fits inside the box and then we have some components that fit on this front panel such as the on off switch the pilot light and the three switches which will actually attach to the circuit board but they'll protrude through like that when we're done here is the remote and also the transmitter and we also have to program an AT1085, which if you watched any of my projects, you know that I use this quite a bit. This AT1085 produces the pulse width modulation that's required to slow the fan down, as well as establish the delay. So we're going to get started with populating the circuit board. And again, 
I'm not going to go over step by step here. And on the circuit board, you want to specify two ounce copper. And that is the thickness of the copper. And what that basically means is the copper is twice as thick, which means it can handle more current. Because, you know, we're going to handle several amps. And we don't want to burn the board up because the traces are too small. And the only real goofy thing about the board is, number one, the switches go on the bottom side. And the other oddity is here, this is called a TI power pad. TI meaning Texas Instruments. And so the heat sink is actually a part of the circuit board itself. And there's a special way you have to solder this on to install this DRV 8871, which is the motor driver. On the board, you'll see a pad in the center on both sides. And there's actually some through holes in here. And if we look at the IC itself, we turn it over and we'll see a little metal base. Well, that metal base has to be soldered to this pad. And when we solder this, I like to use a little bit of this chip quick, which is actually a solder paste, so it's a paste with solder in it. And we just are going to dab a little bit on the end here. And you can use flux. It probably is not quite as good as the paste, but the flux should also work. Then we have to make darn sure that our chip is in the right orientation. And once we get everything lined up, I like to use a little bit of Kapton high temperature tape. And this tape is designed for soldering. And so you see, we're not soldering onto any of the leads at this point. So we're going to actually turn it over. And then we're going to apply some solder to the bottom side of the power pad. When that cools down, we should be able to take the tape off. And it should be stuck together. And I mean, that's, that's on there. And so now we can go in and solder all the leads. And what makes this a little bit easy is that the purple on the board is actually a solder resist, which means that solder will not stick to it. This should be all that's required, but I always like to go a bit of an extra step. So I do have this SMT heat sink, and it's just going to solder to this ground pad on the outside, such as that. And there we go. Once we have these two parts on, then it, you know it's pretty much straightforward with the rest of the board. Then we're just going to start putting some more components in the rest of the board. Now I'm going to put something on called a turret terminal. And this is what a turret terminal looks like. I've got a staking tool which is just a little mandrel. What all happens is you just insert this into there. You install this in there like that. And then we have a punch that we put on here and whack it with a hammer. And it's kind of like a rivet. This mandrel and punch is ridiculously expensive. It's, I think, around $17. And you could do the same thing with a center punch. And you could just use, say, like a, a standoff or something like that. And so now we've got the staked on here. And then I just put a little dab of solder on the back side. So the next step is we want to turn the board over to put the switches on. So the switches actually go on the back side. And we'll just test fit them first. And they should go in the cover like that. And I've marked the cutout, which will allow this to cover it. And this is the outline of the box itself. And to cut that out, I'm going to just use this Remo Versa tip. And it's a model 1550T2. And it's not only a soldering iron, but also you can see it's got an exacto knife, hot knife. And I've got the hole cut, but wouldn't you know it, I messed up. And what I originally intended to do was to mount this board in such a way that I had enough plastic to put the screw holes in the corners. So that means I should have not cut it quite as wide. I should have maybe let it a half inch on each side. But I didn't. I cut the whole thing out. And I should have looked at my design notes, but I didn't. And that's the problem you run into when 
you know, there's a month lead time between the time you design it and the time the boards come in and all that stuff. So I'm going to have to modify it a little bit. And I think I can do okay. I think what I'll do is maybe I will just put this board on with uh, some double-sided tape and then maybe drill a couple holes in the other side of this board uh, for the bottom screws. So it'll actually work out just as well. So I drilled four holes here, 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 and here on the four corners, and they don't look too bad, just a little bit of hardware. And actually, I, I think I'm going to change the design to be this way, so I'll go in and add those holes to the template, because this way, I don't have to monkey with wiring up the switch and having three pieces, you know, flopping around. I can just do it all in one assembly. So actually, I like that that much better. Here's the top, and these two holes here align with the two holes in the top. So this will go from the underside of the fan with a mounting hole, and then these two mounting holes will sandwich down on here like that. And we're ready to start our final assembly. I have taken the cover and I've drilled three holes, one in the bottom, one on each side, and just put some standard grommets in it. We want to feed this module through the hole. And then we're going to attach it with one screw on the bottom, sort of like that. And then we have the other holes for the other screws. And then next we want to put the LED in. press fits in. Yeah, it's a little difficult to see, but I have uh, connected the motor wires here. And really it doesn't matter which wire goes to which on the motor because, you know, one's reverse and one's forward. Now if the thing reverses when it should go forward as far as the logo goes, we can go to software and change the chip. Just change the port assignment and chip. That's no big deal. And then on the feed side we do the same thing on here. And then finally we've put the LED through this hole along with the antenna. And I've tightened down the screws here. A little blue tape here for the antenna. And I will run a bead of silicone around the base. And this fan does take a lot of power. It takes two amps that start up and about one and one third amp while it's running full power so it really doesn't take a lot so I have a little three amp power supply here that will work it's off right now and we're going to put it in local and then we turn it on and intake okay is we got the motor wired right because we feel air coming in and then we ought to be able to slow it down. We slow it down by keep depressing it, then we can speed it back up. And we can shut it off. And this has a brake, so the first few seconds the brake will be on. Now, when that happens, you can't do any other input commands while the brake is on. Alright, we'll try it the other way. Exhaust. Let's see if we can slow it down. Let's see if we can speed it back up. And then we'll turn it off. And this should not work and it doesn't. Now we're going to turn it off which is in the center position and then we're going to go further over it for remote. Now notice the LED is on. Now the remote works. And the remote is interchangeable with the fan. So 
We can slow it down and then we can speed it up. So these controls are interchangeable. And again, turn it off. And also if I were to hit this, then it would be on a timer for one, two to three hours, however many times I hit the timer button. Okay, I'd say that it's working. And that's going to end this video. We'll do another video when it comes time to install it in the RV.